test, 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 test. There we go. Right? You can hear me, right? Okay, great. That's all we need. Good to see you, Tim. <clears throat> Debbie's happy to see you. <clears throat> well, welcome to the... Welcome to the service uh, where we will worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Most God High. Praise His name. He's alive. He's on the throne. Because He lives, you too shall live. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. I have a couple announcements I'd like to share with you um, uh, and some things I'd like to do. Um, if I could get, well, let me, let me deal with the announcements first. Um, we're going to have a baptism here real soon. I haven't figured out all the details for it, uh, but we have an individual who wants to be baptized. And I just wonder, and I want to put it out there, if there's any others who've been thinking about being baptized, um, please let me know. And uh, I haven't set a date for any of this. Um, I will get with our candidates. Um, and I, but I do want to announce it. If anybody else is interested in baptism. Now, folks... Baptism is an exciting day for the church. The Great Commission includes baptism. It's been a long time since we've seen a baptism around here. The church is alive and well. Praise his name. Uh, the other thing that I'd like to do is I would like to meet um, quickly after church with the board. And I would like to meet with, because I want to talk to those of you who've been coming to uh, Biblical Citizenship, it started this, this weekend past. A lot of good stuff there. And I'd like to talk to you guys for a moment, and then um, you might be able to help explain things to the board if, I, if that needs to be, okay? Um, good. So we'll deal with that afterwards. So I'd like, to, I'd like to, just the two groups, the board and those who've been coming to uh, that workshop, all right? Um, Boy, I feel like there's one more important announcement, and I know I'm missing it. Well, the workshop finishes next, I will tell you that, the workshop finishes next weekend, Friday and Saturday. So I'll put a plug in for that. Light for the journey. Yes, ma'am. Tell me. Talk to me. What am I missing? Uh, oh, there's yeah, there's a chili cook-off coming uh, on November 4th. All right. So, yeah, if you like chili, all right, if you like heartburn, please show up. Okay. <laughs> There's something cooking around here, that's for sure. I am grateful to see you. I'm grateful for what God is doing in his church. I'm grateful for what God has done in his church. Father, I don't think I'm the only one grateful. And I ask that what you want to do here today, um, it's yours, it's your day. Not just what you want to do here, but there are people who are, who are tuning in. They're online. And that's the cool thing about you, oh God, is that you can be everywhere and anywhere all at the same time. I don't understand it. But you can. And uh, we ask, Lord, that you be honored by our, our endeavors. Because that's what they are. Someone said to me just this morning that um, the word of the day is if you think you're waiting to be good enough to serve the Lord, you'll be waiting forever. Here we are. We're here to serve you. We're here to worship you. We're here to honor you. You are worthy of our praise, and so much more. All this we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen and amen. 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 Let's stand. Let's worship the Lord. If you can stand. If you can't, it's okay. Um, and let's worship the Lord. I don't have these on, do I? Or Yeah, they're on. <laughs> is overwhelmed, I will look to you alone. God, my rock, God, my rock, God, my rock. You will stand when others 
fall. You are faithful through it all. God, my rock, God, my rock, God, my rock. In the blessing, in the pain. Through it all, you never fail me. You are the strength of my heart. You are the strength. struggle to believe you have not let go of me God my rock God my rock God my rock carried through the darkest storms you have held me in your arms God my rock God my rock God my rock in the blessing in the strength of my heart. You are the strength of my heart. I can rely on you. I can rely on you. You are the joy of my life. You are my song in the night. There is no one as true. Jesus, I trust in you. You are the strength of my heart. The strength of my heart, I can rely on you. I can rely on you. You are the joy of my life. You are my song in the night. There is no one as true. Jesus, I trust in you.
Okay, I know we don't usually do this, but Linda, let's take that one from the very beginning. Pardon me? Let's sing that one again from the very beginning. That's right. All right, now you know it a little bit. <laughs> When my heart is overwhelmed, I will look to you alone. God, my rock, God, my rock, God, my rock. You will stand when others fall. You are faithful through it all. God, my rock, God, my rock, God, my rock. In the blessing, in the pain, through it all you bear. strength of my heart I can rely on you Trustworthy. I can rely on you when I've struggled to believe you have not let go of me God my rock God my rock God my rock carry through the darkest storms you have held me in your arms God my rock God, my rock, God, my rock, in the blessing, in the pain, through it all you never fail me. You are the strength of my heart. You are the strength of my heart. I can rely on you. I can rely on you. You are the joy of my life. You are my song in the night. There is no one as true. Jesus, I trust in you. You are 
tells us that where two or more are gathered, there he will be in the midst.
Holy God, Father, Son, Spirit, we are here in your presence. We are keenly aware of your holiness, of your glory, your Shekinah glory. You are the King of Kings. You are Lord of all. It's not us that determines that. It's who you are. And I am keenly aware and astute this morning that your grace and your mercy is filling this place. That your presence is abundant here in the heart, in the spirit of each worshiper. We sense you. And we sense that you are God and our Father. And 
that we are your children. We confess to you, Lord, that we feel inadequate. We understand that we are frail, at times unfaithful. you are true you're trustworthy and we sang it today we can depend on you we can rely on you you never fail you're always there even in our even in our final moments Lord you'll be there you've not lied to us You've given us great and precious promises, and we praise you. I pray this morning, Lord, for the congregation. I guess, Lord, if, if I could have anything for those that you've given me watch care of, more than health, more than wealth, would be for them to know you to know you more. To know you fresh and new. To know, Lord, from our heritage, from, from past history, that you've been there for us, that you've never failed us. And you have always showed up in our darkest hour. And you'll not start failing now. I do pray for the congregation. I lift them to you. And I pray for their ministry, what you've called them to do. And I pray, oh God, that you you allow them to begin to see the fruits of their labors. Open our eyes. Help us to see like you see. Open our, our minds to understand and think as you think. Open our hearts to love our neighbors. And we pray for our neighbors. Open our courage to stand up, to honor you, to remind our world, God, you got this. Use us. Use us daily. Lord, we would fail you if we didn't pray for those who are in leadership over us. So we pray, Lord, for our spare city that you would just begin to stir in the hearts of leaders a concern, a real concern, a deep concern for the citizens. And in our state, our nation, and for kings, presidents, monarchs, around the world, your will be done. This is our prayer. Jesus, Jesus, you're something else. I just can't get over your love. Your grace. Your mercy. And to the best of our abilities, we love you back. And all the people of God said, and amen and amen.
Father, what we do here is worship for us, and we just ask that you bless both the gift and the giver. It's all yours anyhow. You're the creator, and we are the stewards. Be honored in Jesus' name. Amen. I uh, I can say that it's good to be with you today, and um, it's always cool. I, I I suppose I could say this every every Sunday because it's the way I feel when I leave on Sunday that I needed this. Uh, can you relate? Yeah. yeah, I needed this. Well, I certainly needed to be with you, and I needed to be with uh, God and uh, with God's people, and uh, I I. I what just pops in my mind now is that song. I love the thrill that I feel when I get with God's wonderful people. You know, it's a it's a cool thing to come and worship the Lord together, um, and it's a blessing and it's a privilege. And um, Scripture tells us that it, it's a it's a holy habit. Yeah, that's Pastor Carl paraphrase. Actually, what the Hebrew writer says: Let us not forsake the coming together. But it's a holy habit, or it sure should be. Um, this morning, <coughs> this morning, um, I'm going to preach a message, and I'll explain why, that I preached 11 years ago in this place. Now, you can relax, because any time I preach a message uh, that I've preached before, it's never the same. In fact, I have one message that I preach just about everywhere I go, and my wife tells me every time I'm amazed how you show me and God uses it to teach me new and fresh things. That's because God's word is alive. That's because God's word is always contemporary. And so praise his name. So I am certain that this won't even come close to what it was like when I preached it the first time. Because I know that God wants to speak to us. Now let me give you the reason. I'm not in the habit of giving you reasons why I do what I do. Um, God certainly knows why I do what I do. Um, but to be quite honest and quite transparent, um, it is a good thing to do when you are struggling. See, I know that as I stand before you today and I preach, Carl's not in it. Okay? Just, just, just so you know. And uh, when I'm struggling, I often wait to get Carl out and emotions away and uh, that I might hear God. So this is safe. And this is not my soapbox. All right? This is uh, something God gave me a while ago. I think it's pertinent today. Um, Charlie, can I put you to work for the Lord for a moment? I left, um, I left a book bag right back there in about the third pew from the back, right in the chair. You want to bring that to me? I want to use it. Today's message is the, the word in our lives. Um, you know, 
uh, the word, uh, I, I retitled it so that I would save it because I, there, were, there are changes um, when I went to my original notes, but the word, a love affair. Thank you, Charlie. I appreciate that. Um, the word of God is, is precious to us and um, it's important to us. We're going to deal with Psalm 119, the title of the word in our lives and the key verse is, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Tim, are you having troubles with that? There you go. Thank you. Um, And so that's the key. Um, Tim, you're going to be in the, you're in the scriptures. You're going to have to bounce back and forwards. But right now you need to be in the PowerPoint. All right. It's down at the bottom. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and light unto my path. It was Martin Luther who coined the doctrine sola scriptura, which means only scripture. And uh, and everything that they did, it would be only scripture. Scriptures only. And I have heard it uh, from time to time, and to be quite frank and quite honest, I have thought it the same way, and I thought, you know, only the Bible, only the Bible. Um, And so, um, uh, you know, I've I've heard it from people in in my ministry throughout the ages, and at one time I, I, I actually thought the same way, only the Bible. That is until God, the Holy Spirit, got a hold of me, and did some work on me. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make some references even in the scripture that tells us that there's more than just the Bible. But the Bible should be the first thing. Okay? Um, and so if you were to use only the Bible the, in every aspect of life, and you do use the Bible in every aspect of life, um, you guys are way off base there. It, it didn't show up in the, it should be right there on, okay. All right. Well, Tim, I can't preach and have you make all that noise up, up front with that. That's distracting. All right, eyes on me. We have denomination, scriptura only, Bible only, okay? If we were to use the Bible only, because the Bible has a lot to say in every aspect of life, and I would, I'd be the first to tell you that, and that you should, anytime you have a question, you should go to the Bible for answers, okay? But should that, what I'm trying to say is, should that be the only place you go? I don't think so. Now, the Bible has a lot to say about cooking. In fact, the Bible, Bible shares with, God's people, the Israelites, a lot about food. But if I want to make a steak, is that the only place I can go to learn how to make a steak? Now, I got to tell you that when my, my daughter makes steaks, she likes to put all those juices and special sauces all over it. Now I'm a meat and potato guy, and if you put that on my steak, you just ruined it. All right? I like my steak to taste like steak. I don't want any. I don't want any seasoning. I don't want any sauces. You know, I don't want it marinated in in, in uh, you know uh, salad dressing. I, I don't want that stuff. I want my taste, my steak to taste like I somebody killed a cow for me. Yes, ma'am. I can do that. What I'm trying to say is that sometimes when my wife wants to make things, she'll go to a cookbook not the Bible only. Does that make sense? Yeah. So there are things, and what I want you to understand, there are things that God has put in our lives to help us to understand when he's talking to us. And the first place you should turn is to the Bible. Hear me. The first place you should turn is to the Bible. But when you can't find the ingredients on how to cook a steak in the Bible, it's okay to get out the cookbook. All right? Now, I want 
you to know that as a Wesleyan church, we actually have more in common with the Catholic church than we do the Lutheran church. See, because the Lutheran church says scriptura only, the Bible only. We throw out tradition. We throw out experience, real life experience. It doesn't, it doesn't really count. The only thing that counts is the Bible. And so Catholics, now they, they take... They take not only the scripture, but tradition. And some of you are former Catholics. You know what I'm talking about. I, I'm looking here. I know there's at least a half a dozen people in here that are former Catholics. Now, what Catholics do is, is that you have the Bible, but when we get to church tradition, it's equally, it's, it's equally important. Now, that's not what I've said today. What I've said today is the first place you go to the Bible. And the difference between us and a Catholic church is that we think we think church tradition matters. In other words, when the Holy Spirit was working in the church 150 years ago and how they dealt with social issues should have an impact on how we look at that and we understand that stuff. Okay? And the church said then that, that this was wrong, and so the church needs to look at that and look at the history and the tradition of the church and what the church has been saying all along, and it needs to have and validate where we make our stand theologically and doctrinally today. You guys with me? I'm not too far, right? I'm not. I understand. We're talking about doctrine and theology. And so we have more in common with the Catholic Church because we don't throw out tradition. We just don't make it as important as the Word of God. We also are open, and here's, here's a, a biblical principle for you, for Jesus himself said that he will send the counselor and he will teach you all things. So some things we get from the Bible, and any time we want to double check, is it, because here's the question, when the Holy Spirit's speaking to us, that there's this nagging thing is, is it just me or is it God? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Is it, is it me or is it God? And so the best way to know that is that you go back to your scriptures, and if your scriptures bear it out, then you're like, oh God, you are definitely talking to me. Can I get an Amen. So, you know, when, we, when we're going through this thing called life, I love the psalmist. He said, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It is precious. And what I would suggest to you and what I would suggest to the church is that we start a love affair. Where's my Bible? Well, I got two of them up here. We start a love affair with this book. And we're gonna, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the purpose of this book and what God is up to in this book. And uh, <clears throat> I, I, would just, I would just say to you, just another argument that I have in my notes is that if you, if you, had a, uh, you weren't feeling well and, and uh, you, 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 the Bible has a lot to say about healing, okay? But I would highly recommend that if you're having pains in your chest, you go see a doctor. All right? And there's medical, you know, and, and, and the truth is, is that there are cults out there that have allowed and taught their people that, that you don't need a doctor, and they've allowed people to die. People are made in the image of God, and they are precious in his sight. And the message that I want to share is on the supreme importance of this book today. And how it should be a, a lamp unto our feet and a light uh, to our path. Um, I, I, let me share a scripture, something that Jesus said to you um, that uh, should cause us to just have real pause. Okay? In John five thirty, in John five thirty nine, this is not up there, Tim. Hey, you got it to come up, didn't you? You found it. Awesome. Um, he said this. Jesus said this to the Pharisees. He said, "You diligently study the Scriptures because you think by them you possess eternal life. These are the Scriptures," Jesus said, "that testify about me." 
all right? You, should, you, you think that somehow you're going to get an eternal life, but you need to understand that these scriptures, these scriptures are all about me. And then we find Jesus later on telling, telling us that he is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. And the scriptures testify about him. But a lot of people think, well, okay, if I just scriptura only, and then you would miss Christ, at least in that day. And so it should. And the, the scriptures, and I need us to understand this, because we're living in a day and, 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 a day and age when, and I'm seeing it in the, in, the, uh, in the church, and it's coming out of our culture because there's a lot of things that don't, that don't ring true with what our culture wants to do, that this stands against. And so then if it stands against, then it stands to reason if you want to go with what the culture is teaching us about God, then you've got to find a new version. It's out there, folks. I want you to know that God has had his hand on this book from the time it was conceived. And it came to us, the New Testament came to us through a various of letters, a series of letters. And it wasn't really all collected together in the way that we understand it to about 400 years after Christ. And the early church just dealt with letters that they could wound up and get from here and from there. Did you hear Paul? He wrote a letter and he said this in it. And sometimes they would share the letters and they would pass the letters around and they would circulate. We are blessed to have this. This is so reliable. When they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, it moved our latest transcript. When I went to college, I had to study higher criticism and lower criticism of the Bible. And, um, it's, uh, and what I mean by that is, is that when you go to college, and I don't care if it's a secular college, and you take ancient writings, ancient books, if, it's got, if, if, if they have tests that they give that, to know if they're credible. And all of the secular writings, like Homer and, and those, they have maybe 10 copies. And so the more copies you have, the more it lends itself to credibility, okay? And I, and I want you to know that, that um, there are, boy, 30 years ago, there was almost, almost um, I think it was like 100,000 copies. It's way surpassed that now of New Testament scriptures and Old Testament scriptures. They discovered when they, when they dig up sarcophagus, you know, and richer people, they had in the, those days, um, they, uh, would, they would, when you buried them, you know, they would mummify them, and so they would wrap them with, with, with what we would consider newspaper today. They would gather all writings, and they would wrap them. And so, and so uh, I was... I was um, I was at a lecture, and um, it wasn't, I want to say Gary Smalley, but it wasn't Gary Smalley. I got the wrong guy in my head, but yeah, D uh, Josh McDowell, and he, and he talked about, he, he took all his savings, and he bought this, this one, and he, t he said it was, it was a roll of, the roll of a dice, and he said, and he bought this, uh, um, <clears throat> this figurehead, and then he hired guys to come in. And uh, it, it, at the time, it was worth, I forget how, it was worth like a half a, half a million dollars or, or a million and a half dollars in the state it was. And he wanted them to take it apart. And so they, they come in and these experts started, by, layer by layer, began to peel off all these clippings. These, what, in, in Jesus' day, what would be considered newspaper clippings that they would wrap the body in. And as he tore it away, uh, as they would take them away, and they've discovered that they can do this, and they begin to discover some of the writings of the scriptures. All of a sudden, his investment increased tenfold. God blessed him for his risking it all. Went to his wife and said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cash in our retirement. I'm going to cash in our 401s. I'm going to cash in everything. We're going to liquidate everything. We're going to buy this thing. Are you in? And she said, let's do it. And he did it. And then, then you can imagine as, as those guys are pulling them back and they're waiting for these things to dry out and they're waiting to see them. And he's getting, he's getting writings to Timothy and he's getting portions. And they get little segments. And then they go back to the, the originals that they have. And oh my goodness, and they begin to match up. 
I want to tell you that there is more than a million copies of this ancient text out there. That there is no book like this book that passes higher criticism, that passes lower criticism. One, one criticism is where you take a look at what it says and does it match up. The other one matches, does it, does it match up with all the rules that we have for ancient books of antiquity. And I want you to know that God has had his hand in this and that God has watched over it and that this is important to God and that he led, the scripture is true, that he led men to write down and to to share what he had to say. The scriptures, um, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Dead Sea Scrolls were a tremendous find. Back in in the 60s when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, they went back, they, they unraveled them. I had a professor, I happened to be going to Malone College. He was in on the dig as a student there and how exciting it was when he began to explain some things to me and show some things to us as students. And he said, when they, when they took those and they treated those scrolls and they rolled them out and they began to compare them to the Old Testament, Isaiah, and it matched up. It matched up perfectly. A thousand five hundred years earlier is the manuscript and they're matching up to the, what they had. I want to tell you, it's a miracle. This word is important. And what I want to know is, do you have a love affair with it? Why is it so important? Because God thinks it's important for you to have and for you to know. Matthew 4.4, 4, Jesus said, It is written, man does not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. I want to take you to the scriptures, and I want to, Tim, this is where you back out and you get into the scriptures, and I want to read to you a portion of scriptures out of Psalm 119. This is, um, in this psalm, the psalmist writes, in starting with verse 90, uh, verse 97, yeah, I'm sorry, it's all right, Tim, you got to slide that out of the way, my friend. If you just take your mouse, yeah, and just push that over on the other screen, there you go. There you are. <laughs> then you have to bring it back because of the way you're doing it. I, I put it into that, that presentation, but I don't know why it's not there, bud. Um, here's what the psalmist writes. Oh, how I love your law. You know, he's talking about law. This book. Oh, how I love your law. I meditated on it all day long. Your commands make me wiser Verse 98, your commands make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more insight than all my teachers. You want to know what the word will do for you? I have more insight than all my teachers. Why? How can that even be true? Because God the Holy Spirit's involved in it. For I meditate on your statutes. I have more understanding than the elders. For I obey your precepts. I have kept my feet from every uh, evil path so that I might obey your word. I have not departed from your laws, for you yourself have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste. Sweeter than honey to my mouth. I gain understanding from your precepts. Therefore, I hate every wrong path. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. I have taken an oath and and confirmed it that I will follow your righteous law. I have suffered much. Preserve my life, O Lord, according to your word. Accept, O Lord, the willing praise of my mouth and teach me your laws. Though I constantly take my life in my hands, I will not forget your law. The wicked have set a snare for me, but I have not strayed from your precepts. Your statutes are my heritage forever. They are the joy of my heart. My heart is set on keeping your decrees to the very end. 
to God be all the honor and the praise for his word to us. Aren't you glad we read that today? Doesn't it stir your heart to know him more? To know him better? Well, you can. For he is here. And he'll be found in these pages. The whole purpose of the Bible is to illuminate God. God saw to it why this is so important, why this passes every test, why it's a miracle just to have it, why you and I and in the church of America are more than blessed is that one of these is in pretty much in every home. We are blessed beyond measure. We have the word of God with us, and it is a miracle. And in this word, the purpose of this word is that God might illuminate, that God might illustrate, that God might demonstrate who he is and what he feels and thinks and has done for you and for me. Praise his name. That is the infinite God might somehow reveal himself to a finite man. John writes, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Referring to Jesus Christ. He was with God in the beginning, meaning Jesus was in on creation, and through him all things were made, that without him nothing was made that has been made. And in him was life, and that life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. Oh, do you want to know God? Do you want to know him more? Do you want to see God? Then open the word. And there's, it's no, no coincidence why Jesus is also called the word to us. And the word of God is a living, breathing document. But it's more than that. It's spirit-filled. And God speaks to you and me through the pages of his word to us. And each time I read the same thing over and over, or any time I preach a message that I preached 11 years ago, it is fresh and it is new, not because I've come up with a new idea, but because God the Holy Spirit is a part of it. And it's active and it's pertinent to now. Praise His name. In verse 14 of John in the same chapter says this, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us, and we have seen His Glory, the glory of the one only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. I want you to know that it is a, uh, uh, that the word is um, a love affair. And I, I want to illustrate this. Um, I, went and, I went and dug this out, and Charlie brought it to me. And my wife said, you're going to take that to church? And I said, yes, I am. And because I think it so illustrates, oh, there's my checkbook. Jackie, see me after church. There's, uh, I was thinking I left it at home. Uh, but I, I didn't, um, because this will illustrate just exactly what the word should be like to us. Um, in this box, this is a precious box. This is her box. She had this um, when she was a teenager. Um, I think, didn't you get it from your grandmother? No. Um, but anyhow, and it doesn't, it, it, sets, it sets on her dresser. And it's full of goodies, okay? I mean, it's just jam-packed, all right? There's all kinds of things. And I was, um, as I was looking in here this, this morning, uh, there, there's my youngest son, and it's got precious pictures in here. And um, it's got pictures. If you want to see my wife with real long hair, and this is with our, with our firstborn. Um, and this is a picture of our first. You know, they just got pictures in here. Um, there are cards in here uh, that I have sent my wife. Um, over the years that, that must be special to her. Um, they're just all kind. Here's, here's a lock of hair from our daughter. You, you, this is a goodie box. And there, there are all kinds. And I'm not going gonna, gonna, gonna to share one letter. It, it was on top. And I, just, I picked it and I went through it. Um, here's a love note um, that I wrote to my wife. It's titled Sugar. Okay, we were high school sweethearts. And I was 15 years old. What did I know? cool thing is, is she didn't know anything either. Um, she thought I was just a hunk of hunk of burning love. I love it. This particular piece, it's old and yellow. But 
you understand how important these are in my family? Do you understand how precious these are? So this is, we're married. I have no, no idea. And I'm only going to read a portion of hers because some of it's none of your business. Okay? Um, I'm guessing, is, I have to be careful with these. I don't. You, you notice the honor that I'm showing this. You know what honor is. <gasps> I'm careful not to tear this and open it. So this is, a, uh, this is a note that I wrote my wife, I'm pretty sure, before I went off to work, and I put it, probably left it on a table. Now, what you need to know in our house that uh, when we were young and uh, I got married at 18 and she was uh, 20, and then we had a child um, about a year later, and we're still trying to figure out life. Um, and um, <clears throat> I, uh, we, we were married, and, and she used to, she, what, I, what I'm driving at, we were poor, okay? I have had the church give us poundings. You know what pounding is? That's an old-fashioned term. When we were trusting God and tithing, and we, our doctor was telling us we needed meat for our, our youngest son. He was anemic, and... Uh, we had $35 at that time, or $30, to buy groceries, and all we could afford was macaroni, cheese, and hot dogs, and he's telling us that our youngest son needed meat. And I had testified in church, and that night they, 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 they filled a freezer full of meat. They, and I wasn't their pastor, I was just a layman. And God is faithful. And we were poor, and so... I used to carry sack lunches. I got a lunch box now. I take a lunch bag. It's, it's cool, you know, and I can afford to buy those kind of things today, but not in those days. And so I paper sacked it. And I would give my lunch and head off to work. And uh, quite often, um, I wouldn't let folks know, but there would be this note stuck in my lunch. And she, at one point, she was drawing faces and I love you and hearts all over my paper sack lunch. You know, and I would take it and put it on the lunch table and I'm, and I'm thinking, and all the guys are giving this, this, this 18, 19-year-old kid grief. You know, it, it's sport for them. And I said to her, honey, I said, you know, can you, can you scribble it on the inside? But she used to give me all these notes. And then we would write notes in high school. This is one that I had done somewhere along the line. Um, I learned some things from my wife. She teaches me well. And so I, I left her a note. I'm pretty sure it was early in the morning, and she found it when she got up later. And I titled, uh, I wrote on it, Love. By the time you get home, it should be raining, but don't let it ruin the rest of your day. Just look out um, at the, the showers and think of it as a token from God to uh, let you and I know that uh, he is showering us and um, blessing us um, just as his rain makes spring flowers grow and blossom. Love ya. And of course, my pet name is Carlos. For those of you who don't know, I'm not Hispanic. She just likes Spanish. And then I wrote a P.S. Don't uh, forget to say a wee prayer for me today. Just wanted to brighten her day. These were together. This is the reply. I got a note. I left a note. I got a note. My love. Thank you for the beautiful thoughts you left for me. They were truly a blessing. They helped me to keep going when I wanted to slump exhaustedly into the nearest chair. Indeed, I said, uh, we prayer. For you also a prayer of thanksgiving that I have been blessed with such a spirit-filled husband. I love you, dear. 
every day. I feel close to you. The Lord is truly doing a work. And she goes on and there's personal things in here. John writes in his letters, this is love, that God first loved us. While we were yet sinners, he died for us. It's personal. It's for each one of you. And every page in this book, his word is designed to be helpful to encourage you, to remind you that he has made promises to you, to remind you from time to time when you're feeling down and you're feeling low and when danger, you know, the psalmist wrote about the danger all around. He had enemies. Life is real, isn't it? Bad things happen to good people, don't they? Including God's people because the rain falls on the just and the unjust, just the same. God is blessing the world. And I would add that God is blessing the world because of the church. Because he hasn't come to get his church. And he's letting you know. He's in it with you. He says, for lo, I am with you always. To the ends of the earth, I'm with you. And all things are possible because you guys are more than conquerors. You know, that comes, from, that comes from the God who loves you preciously. And there are so many promises in this book. And so many helps in this book. And this book is a miracle to us and it's a blessing to Americans. And um, let me just say, read it. <laughs> okay? Read it with fresh eyes. Read it with, with new eyes, and let me, let me see if I can wrap this up quickly, and let me just make a few of the points that I have. Tim, you'll, you're, you're back in it. Yeah, you're awesome. The Word is, uh, uh, is not only a love affair, but the Word of God, where God is trying to expose Himself to you and, and show Himself to you, and people say, oh, if I could just see God. Well, read your Bible. You'll see God in it, and you'll see how He feels about you, and you see uh, what he was done for you, and you'll learn the things of God that are so awesome, and it will be a light unto your path, and it'll keep you from falling. It'll keep you from going astray. It'll keep you close to God. What do family and the word have in common? You know, the, family, the word is a family affair. We're children of God. God says, I will, be your, I will be your God and you will be my children. Well, families, family affairs, these are the things that happen in family. The family, uh, what do they have in common? Uh, the word instructs. The word protects. That's what the psalmist was writing. You protect me from evil. It provides. The word is relational. Isn't that amazing? I, re I remember thinking when I first became a Christian that, that, the God, that the God of the Old Testament seemed to be different than the God of the New Testament, at least from my, my perspective. And then the, the more I began to get in the word, the more I began to read the word, I began to realize two things about the Old Testament. The Old Testament, first of all, points to Jesus Christ and everything that it does. And the second thing that I learned is that the Old Testament has more to say about the love of God than the New Testament. Praise His name. It's relational. And it, it reveals. And it strengthens. And it's healthy. And it's balanced. And it encourages. And uh, we get a sense of God's love. It loves. It's a lamp for my feet. I think to keep us from losing balance because uh, you have uh, around you doctrine scriptura only and then you have some that would say that tradition is as equal as, as the scriptures and 
I don't think that's true, but I don't think you should throw the baby out with the bathwater either. I think, I think what God has done in the church past tradition is important. In fact, I give you an example. Not too long ago, I preached a message on, on uh, the Sparkle Creed, all right? And then I made us all re- re- recite the Apostles' Creed. You know what the Apostles' Creed is? It's tradition. Now, when I did that, weren't you glad for tradition? Yeah. All of a sudden, it became important, didn't it? Yeah. You know, to keep sometimes uh, the, the, the God's word is a lamp to our feet. It, sometimes it keeps us from making wrong choices, which puts us on a path um, that we, we wouldn't belong. And along the path, that God keeps illuminating if we're on the wrong path. He keeps illuminating places where we've stumbled and fallen and uh, gotten away from him so that um, when... Um, we are, we're about to stumble and, uh, from traveling in the wrong direction. God, the Holy Spirit, will speak to, into our lives. And most often, he'll speak a, a verse I have found. Not always. And I would suggest to you that God's word and what God has in mind is he challenges us and he convicts us. And uh, he, his word beacons us to make right steps. It helps us. And it's there for us. And he's there for us. And God doesn't want anything. I want you to know this. God doesn't want anything but our best. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, would not be deterred from the cross even when all cried, crucify him. He who knew no sin became our sin offering. Do you not think that he will not try to save you all along the path of life? Especially if you're on a wrong direction. Of course he will. And it only doesn't, I want you to know that the psalmist, not only does it apply to the wrong path, but it also applies to the right path that he leads us and guides us, even if we're on the right path. And too often we think there are no perils along the right path, but it's not true. There are. For Satan, Jesus told Peter, he said, to be self-controlled and alert, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour it's a light unto my path. It keeps us from making bad choices for our lives, both now and eternally, physically and spiritually. It's for our souls. To be spiritually healthy, you want to have a balanced intake. And I want to, I want to leave you with this thought. What I mean, you know, with the scriptura only in the Bible to, should take precedence and should have precedence. And it should be as precious as this letter was and these notes that were written uh, years ago. And it should be uh, as honored to us in the same way. But in Romans, Scripture says that Paul writes to the church in Rome, and he makes a there in that first chapter, he makes a list of what ungodly men are doing. And he, while it's in the Scriptures, he uses nature to condemn them with. And if you, if you look in, in Romans, he says that, that they do these things, these ungodly things and uh, things that our culture seems to promote. Uh, they do these ungodly things and they invent new and fresh ways to, to even be worse. And he says, and all of creation screams against them, that there is a God who wants to do better in our lives. And I want you to know that nature, and isn't it amazing? And how many people have you met that said, oh, if I want to be close to God, I just go out and I get out on a path and I get out into nature. Why? Because all of nature, you know, all of nature glorifies the creator. And who is the creator but God? See, and I can go to the hills of West Virginia, and we were, we were coming up through, um, when we were on vacation, we were coming up through, and we got in just a little piece. We stayed, in a, we stayed at a hotel up there in the, in the, in the hillbilly hills, uh, uh, and, and it was a glorious thing, and my wife was in her element, and she loves to be in West Virginia. And if you ever get a chance, you ought to go see um, Blackwater Falls. And there's a bridge show that's a mile long that goes across, and it's way down deep. And you'll drive along, and you'll be in the clouds as you go into the mountains. And it is fascinating to me. And then you'll be scared to death as you go around some curves. And those idiots in West Virginia, they drive like demons on those roads. And I don't know. And you'll be praying to God, I promise you. And it'll be a spiritual experience in more ways than one.
You have God's word. And God himself came down. Not here now, but you want to see God? You want to see God? You want to know the heart of God? You want to be close to God? He will talk to you personally. He is dying to have a love affair with you. How about you? Father in heaven, I am grateful to be a part of the church of Jesus Christ. I am honored to be a pastor. I'm a thrilled to be a preacher of the word. Right now we have a culture that is not in season. But I will preach it in season and out of season, Lord. And I will do everything in my power to share how good you are, Lord, and all that you have to say in your word. But I pray for your people that they find themselves deep in the rich pages Lord, I'm smart enough to know that we live in an electronic age, and I, I, I know that there's nothing wrong with an electronic Bible. That's not what I'm saying, Lord. What I'm saying is, is that whatever, whatever form we read your word in, cause us to have a love affair. Cause us to fall deeply in love with you. Cause us to see you fresh and new. Lord, you gave it to us that you might be able to reveal yourself, your holy self, your godly self, to a mind that can't begin to comprehend you. And yet we can. And there's the miracle of it. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, I pray these things. Amen and amen and amen. May God cause his face to shine upon you. May he bless you. May, you. may you just feel his countenance this week in everything that you do. May he bless everything you lay your hand to. And may you bring him honor, glory, and praise in all that you do. God bless you. Thank you.